Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Charlie Sharpless. I'm the Assistant Director for Research here at the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment. And I'd like to welcome you all to the last uh, session in our summer seminar series, New Light, Rising Stars in Energy and the Environment. The series features early career researchers working with faculty at the Anlinger Center, um, where our mission is to develop practical solutions for a sustainable energy future through research, education, and knowledge transfer between academia and broader civil society. This is an inherently transdisciplinary challenge, and correspondingly, the New Light seminars draw from a wide variety of fields across engineering, energy systems, and material science, social sciences, public policy, and many other disciplines. It's a fascinating breadth of work, and we're excited to feature the work of some of these outstanding scholars in this series. Today, we have two speakers who will present for about 20 minutes, leaving 10, 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, given the compressed format, I'd ask that you hold any questions for the end, and we do expect to have some people with us today on Zoom. So for you folks out there in some other part of the world, if, when you, if you'd like to submit a question, please submit it through the Q&A feature or the chat box, and we'll, we'll address it during the Q&A session. Our first speaker is Dr. Ani Rud Mohan, uh, who goes by Ani. Ani earned both a bachelor's in mechanical engineering, uh, in mechanical engineering, and a master's in nuclear engineering from the University of Manchester. He went on to earn his PhD in engineering and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University, where his research focused on the policy implications of EV automation and its impacts on meeting electrification goals. He joined Princeton in 2022 as a distinguished postdoctoral fellow at the Anlinger Center working with Eric Larson, senior research engineer, and Professor Jesse Jenkins. Ani's current research is examining the system level impacts of emerging technologies in deep decarbonization pathways, such as the various interactions that large scale deployment of direct air capture might have on the electricity sector, which is the subject of his talk today. Please join me in welcoming Ani. Great. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Charlie, for the introduction. So as Charlie mentioned, uh, I did my PhD at Carnegie Mellon, and my topic of focus was autonomous vehicles. Um, so when I came to Princeton, I figured what's an even crazier emerging technology to work on that's fitting into that sci-fi theme and sucking CO2 out of the air just seemed perfect for that. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the system level impacts of direct air capture. Uh, I just want to acknowledge my collaborators as well, uh, some of whom are in the room today. So that might be a crazy idea, but uh, large scale carbon dioxide removal is not. Um, the IPCC has called carbon dioxide removal a necessary element to achieve net zero emissions and global scenarios that actually achieve the Paris Agreement goals of limiting, limiting temperature to 1.5 or two degrees Celsius increase above pre-industrial levels actually have billions of tons of removal from the atmosphere every year. Uh, and these negative emissions in these modeling pathways are usually achieved through bioenergy bio with CCS or BEX. Uh, but DAC is also starting to see some growth in recent analyses, uh, including the Princeton Net Zero America study, where you actually had about a billion tons of DAC deployment in one of the scenarios. Um, so this uh, figure on the right is a stylized emission pathway for um, emissions to get to net zero. So the black line is basically uh, net greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then the dashed black line is net CO2 emissions. Uh, the first thing that you can see is that policymakers in the developed world have committed to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and that already implies that you're net negative on CO2. And many of them don't realize this when, when, they, when you pointed out to them that they've actually committed to this. Um, so CDR has maybe three roles. We, have, we can accelerate near-term mitigation. Uh, we can offset residual emissions in order to get to net zero overall. Uh, and then we can actually go net negative in the future if we want to offset for historical emissions. So DAC is part of a whole suite of technologies that enable carbon dioxide removal. Um, you have conventional ones that are being used today, such as afforestation at a very simple level, uh, land management, uh, the soil-based methods. There's interest uh, in recent times in ocean-based removal methods as well. Uh, so DAC maybe is one of the more technology or engineering style methods for removal. Um, and as such, it has some advantages. So it has relatively limited constraints to scale uh, as opposed to say land-based methods. Uh, it has stronger verifiability and additionality. You can really prove that 
you know, using your energy footprint or materials footprint that you really suck the CO2 out of the air, as opposed to say, planting trees or something like that, where it's difficult to verify that it was actually additional. Uh, it has limited uncertainties with respect to ecosystem impacts, as opposed to say something like ocean-based removal, where you're really unsure what the ecosystem impacts might be at the moment. Uh, and then there's permanence of storage at a scale of 10,000 years or longer if you couple with uh, geological storage. So uh, today we're already doing billions of tons of carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere, uh, but almost all of it is uh, conventional uh, land use management, basically. Um, and a tiny, tiny sliver of it is things like BEX and biochar. Uh, this figure is from a state of carbon dioxide removal report that came out earlier this year, the first of its kind, which I contributed to, and really talks about how we need to scale uh, CDR at a global level significantly in order to meet Paris Agreement targets, and particularly this novel CDR uh, bit here, uh, which, which DAC is part of. So if, if DAC needs to scale, um, the good news is that we have some momentum, especially in the US, in terms of policy support and private sector support. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill has assigned uh, $3.5 billion for DAC hubs in the country, uh, with the goal of 1 million tons of capture per, per year per hub. And the Inflation Reduction Act offers a subsidy of uh, $180 per ton of CO2. So if you do capture and, and store that CO2, you'll get a check from the government for that amount. Um, but most importantly, the private sector is really stepping up with corporate voluntary procurement. So the Frontier Front was launched by Stripe and other technology companies, and they're coming to almost a billion dollars in CDR purchases, including DAC. And this is really driven by some of their commitments. So Microsoft has pledged to be carbon negative over the entire lifetime of the company by 2050. So if you've made commitments like that, you're obviously in the market looking for verifiable uh, additional removals and, and negative emissions that benefits uh, DAC. And the Department of Energy has a, a future cost target for DAC to get to $100 per ton CO2 of levelized capture cost. So in terms of the introduction, sort of linkages with the power, uh, power system, so DAC is very energy intensive. That's one of its biggest drawbacks because of the uh, low concentration of CO2 in ambient air. So DAC will interact with the power system in three ways. You have demand for grid power for DAC-based technologies. You can couple with low carbon thermal generators such as geothermal or nuclear, um, and that might impact their operations and economics. And DOE is already sponsoring some um, feed studies to actually look at the possibility of doing this. Uh, and then there you can provide CO2 removal as a decarbonization goals to actually get to net zero electricity, for example. And most of the literature on DAC as focused on the technology itself at the site level. So how do you design the capture process? What are the costs of doing so? Um, and there are very few system level analyses of what DAC deployment might imply. Uh, one system-wide study that was done found that DAC consumed about 5% of US electricity demand by 2100, which is clearly uh, not, not trivial. So in this, in this present work, um, the research question is, how will DAC uh, deployment impact current power systems and then future decarbonized power systems? Uh, our approach is to study the state of Texas, which is the ERCOT grid. And the reason for that is that Texas will see a lot of deployment of DAC because of the high sequestration potential. It's uh, islanded from the rest of the US grid, so the Western and Eastern interconnections. So if we can study the effects of DAC in isolation, uh, on the grid, and it also has a wide variety of generators, so that allows us to see how that might interact with different power plants. Uh, we use the open source Gen X capacity expansion model that's built in Julia. So this is a uh, basically an optimization model that minimizes the sum of investment, operational, and fuel costs to meet electricity demand in a given year, subject to a number of engineering uh, market and, and policy constraints. So we look at two uh, DAC approaches, basically trying to represent uh, a suite of approaches that fall in these categories. Uh, the first is a solid sorbent approach that basically uses lower temperature heat that could couple with nuclear or geothermal plants. And the second is a purely electric uh, based approach that consumes electricity uh, and then uses voltage swings to, uh, for the capture and regeneration. Um, so for the purely electric approach, we have some estimates from the literature in terms of the electricity consumption per ton of capture. Uh, and the same for the heat-based approach, we, we focus on coupling with nuclear power plants, um, and we, we vary the heat consumption per ton of CO2, uh, which you can see in the table on the right. There is some electricity consumption as well for the, the heat-based approach, that's mainly for the CO2 compressors, uh, and we, we enforce that from the, the plant as well. 
we did screen as well for flexibility. So basically the ability to start up and shut down quickly, but we found that that wasn't such an important parameter as, as compared to the, the energy consumption. And so basically our, our research question is, you're consuming all this power, but you're providing CO2 re removal as a service. What's the trade-off and what are the impacts on, on the power sector? So uh, for the nuclear plant, there are some um, design modifications that you have to do to the plant in order to actually enable it to couple with DAC. You obviously don't want to mess around with the reactor core itself uh, for a, a number of good reasons. Uh, but what you can do is modify the steam flows at the plant. So you have some steam coming out of the reactor core, um, and that usually would go into a high pressure turbine for most standard uh, US PWR, specialized water reactors, and then to a low, low pressure turbines. And so this, this figure is from a paper in 2020 where they actually uh, model this, um, assuming a fixed bleeding of steam of about 5% before the high pressure turbine that goes into the, the DAC system here. Um, and then basically you can recover some of the steam before the low pressure turbines and so your low pressure turbine output is not impacted. Um, so you do sacrifice some generation of the high pressure turbine. Uh, so we, we adopt this approach, but we make some modifications. We don't assume a fixed 5% number. We allow that to be endogenous in our model. Uh, we also apply a constraint that the total steam available for DAC is basically uh, constrained by the total nuclear capacity in the grid. Uh, and then we also, um, apply the penalty on the generation at the plant level. So we can monitor the straight off between doing DAC and also the output that you get from the, from the nuclear plant. So this is the ERCOT grid today. Uh, for those of you who might not know about this, so um, they have a wide variety of generators, as I said, uh, including natural gas plants, coal plants, nuclear and, and renewables. Uh, what we find is that because of the credits from the Inflation Reduction Act for solar and wind, even without any DAC deployment, just in a baseline case, if you have a capacity expansion uh, of the power, power system to 2035, you see a huge deployment of wind and solar, and that would actually reduce emissions on the power grid by about 40 to 45% compared to current levels. So that's the, the baseline case that we use. So uh, the first thing that we do is we deploy different amounts of annual DAC removal, which is supposed to represent corporate voluntary procurement. And then we want to see what are the impacts on power system emissions, right? So on the y-axis, you have net CO2 reductions uh, divided by the total removals that a, a corporate buyer might be paying for. So ideally, you want to be at or above 100%, right? So you want to see the total system reductions in CO2 are exactly what someone paid for, or, or they're even better because you stimulated new clean capacity to come online. And on the x-axis is the varying electricity consumption per ton of CO2 so that basically represents different energy efficiency of the, the capture process uh, for a purely uh, electric process. So what we can see is that uh, at the level of 1 million tons of CO2 uh, deployment per year, um, as you have a sort of more energy inefficient process, you're actually losing almost 75 to 80%, maybe even 90% of the removals that you paid for. So you're paying for 1 million tons of removal. What you actually get is 10% of that once you account for the fact that there's a rebound in power sector emissions because of increased load, uh, which basically stimulates more dispatch of coal and natural gas plants. Now at 10 million tons of uh, removal, the outcomes are slightly better. And that's primarily because at this higher level of load, you actually have to incentivize new generation to come online. And because of the uh, wind and solar subsidies that I mentioned earlier, most of the clean generation, that's new generation that's coming online at the margin, new plants that are being built are cleaner. Um, so you have a slightly improved outcome, but even here at, at the lower end of the energy efficiency, you're basically losing about 75% of, of reductions that you thought you were paying for. So for the nuclear process, uh, we have something much much very different. Uh, so because we have existing nuclear capacity that we can use, uh, you can see that basically you're staying at about 100% of, of reduction, so you don't really have much leakage. Uh, at the higher levels of energy consumption per ton of CO2, you start to suffer quite a bit of penalty at the nuclear plant in terms of generation, and so that brings you slightly below 100% uh, at 1 million tons of CO2 per year. Now, at 10 million tons uh, per year, something interesting happens. We Because we constrain the nuclear capacity in the system, uh, for the heat available, you actually have to build new nuclear plants to come online. Uh, and that really improves your emission outcomes because now you're incentivizing new clean uh, generation to come online to run 24 seven, which is what nuclear plants do. Um, and that basically gives you additional removals compared to what you paid for. So you're forcing the system to go in a, in a cleaner direction. 
But of course, this drives up system costs significantly because new nuclear is extremely expensive. Uh, so then our question was, how, how does this basically um, matter on a system cost basis once you've controlled for the emission reductions? So we constrained the net CO2 reduction in the system to be the same as what you paid for, for your DAC deployment or, or better, but it can't be any worse. And we then see what the system level impacts are on, on the cost of the system uh, for varying levels of energy efficiency of the capture process. So both for the heat-based process on the bottom x-axis and the electricity process on the uh, upper x-axis. Um, so for nuclear, we can see again that we have um, basically a relatively flat line uh, for the 1 million ton uh, per CO2 case uh, per year. And then for the 10 million ton case, you do see an increase in costs. Um, so you want to be as low as possible on the dollar per ton abated. Uh, so you do see an increase in cost, but you also see improvements in the total reductions in emissions because you're really incentivizing a lot of two, new clean generation to come online. Uh, so it still remains relatively flat. Uh, but for the electricity, ca uh, electricity capture process, uh, basically, you can see that it's almost double um, the system level cost or even more of, than nuclear. And that's primarily because it's much harder uh, for the uh, grid to actually move in a cleaner direction and be constrained to not have leakages in emissions. Uh, and that, that particularly matters as you get to higher levels of deployment and higher levels of energy consumption. Uh, so basically a 10% reduction in the electricity consumed per ton of CO2 for the grid-based approach reduces system level costs uh, for the power system by about 12%. Uh, and nuclear is about um, twice as better as the uh, purely electric approach. So this basically shows that we need uh, careful procurement rules to, to drive um, deployment of DAG in order to ensure maximum additionality. Uh, and we have a few open questions on this. So the first is, how do you design those procurement rules? Um, what is the opportunity cost of deploying additional clean energy resources to power DAC deployment? Uh, was it just decarbonizing the power grid? What is the pace of deployment that we need for renewables in order to keep uh, those leakages to minimum? And which DAC concepts or processes appear most likely to pair well with longer term decarbonization goals? Even if, let's say, 10 years from now, DAC doesn't work out and, it, and we stop deploying it, which is the technology that we should deploy now and test out now to steer the system in a better direction. Uh, so we've just received a, a grant from Frontier to, to study this uh, as they are interested in some of these questions as well as they purchase CDR themselves. So the second question uh, that I want to talk about briefly is how actually DAC can help achieve a net zero power system. Um, and, and this is basically because the Biden White House has announced an ambitious goal of net zero electricity in the US by 2035. And previous literature has shown that a net zero power system will really rely on low carbon firm resources, which are expensive, like new nuclear, uh, as well as expensive peaker plants like zero carbon fuel turbines that maybe are using hydrogen. Uh, so that last mile of abatement, that marginal cost for the last 10 to 20% is really high. And so maybe that can play a role. Um, so this is again for the, for the state of Texas. So you can see this is for the month of July, which is kind of peak load uh, summer period. Uh, this is what a net zero power system might look like. You have uh, lots of nuclear online, uh, some amount of zero carbon fuels. Um, that's basically hydrogen fuel here. Uh, lots of wind and solar, of course, and then some uh, peak demand being met by both batteries and, and flexible demand uh, on the grid. So the question is, okay, if we put DAC into this, can we save on some of these expensive generation resources? But of course, you're trading off the, the power consumption for DAC. Um, so in a case where we have 1 million tons of DAC deployed, uh, again, just using the electric-based system, so just grid-based approach, because all electricity is clean in this case, um, what we see is that basically DAC allows natural gas with CCS with incomplete capture. So we assume 90% capture rates here uh, to play a role and, and substitute in for both nuclear and zero carbon fuel resources. And that significantly can help um, basically reduce your capacity that you need for those resources and, and therefore save on costs. And, and the natural gas with CCS option is not available uh, in the case on the left with the net zero power system because we have, we are assuming incomplete capture and there's no, nothing to offset those emissions. Um, so the question is how expensive can DAG be and still play a role in reducing overall system costs because that last 10 to 20% of, of deployment or, or marginal abatement is so expensive. Um, so what we do is there's uncertainty around the cost of DAG and what we wanna do is find out what the value of DAG is for the system. 
so in this graph on the left, you have the, the capital cost of the CapEx of a DAX system uh, for one ton of CO2 removal a year. Um, and then on the right y-axis is the annualized CapEx. So this is like levelized CapEx. Uh, if you ask someone today what that costs, they'll tell you something around 800 to maybe $1,000 per ton CO2. As I mentioned, there's a, there's a target to get it to $100 per ton CO2 in the future. Uh, so what we find with the grid-based approach and the results are pretty similar for the, for the nuclear approach as well, is that you, you can be really expensive uh, up until about maybe two to 3 million tons of deployment and still add a lot of value to the system. Um, that value falls off rapidly after the first few hundred thousand tons of deployment because of the reasons I mentioned earlier that that last 10 to 20% is really difficult for the power sector. Um, and so even at $800 per ton CO2, which is pretty much the cost of that today, you would still be able to deploy more than 2 million tons of DAC and have a cheaper system um, than what you would without DAC. And the way we do this is we basically constrain the level of deployment to the levels on the x-axis, and then we solve for the dual of that constraint. So basically the Lagrangian multiplier that tells you how much you would be willing to pay in order to not have that constraint in your optimization. And that basically tells you, from that we can back out the, the capex of the system. So the reason these cost reductions are achieved is because DAC substitutes, allows natural gas with CCS to substitute for expensive resources, such as lithium-ion batteries, uh, and zero carbon fuel combustion turbines or combined cycle plants. Um, so here we're basically using the varying the level of capex for DAC and also the annual DAC removal. Uh, again, you can see at about eight hundred dollars per ton CO two levelized cost, which is the cost today. Um, you will be getting rid of about 70, 60 to seventy percent of the requirement of hydrogen fuel turbine generation and about forty to fifty percent of the lithium ion battery output, and that really has huge cost savings. Uh, so DAC is expensive, but the real, you know, the reality is that the last 20, 10 to 20% of decarbonization is also really expensive, and this might be a way to actually save some costs. So to conclude, um, we can see that DAC has significant impacts on the power system emissions, particularly in the near term, we need to be thinking carefully about how we procure that energy. Um, initial DAC deployment should probably focus on using uh, low existing resources as, as much as they are available instead of grid, grid energy. Um, and then at million ton scale for net zero grid, DAC offers significant value, even at high levelized costs of about $1,000 per ton CO2. Um, and financial support for DAC from these corporate voluntary procurements can actually act as a pull for new generators to come into the system, uh, such as geothermal or new nuclear power plants. Um, and that's something that we want to study in, in future work is how should those long-term emission reductions be accounted for? So you force some DAC in, you're forcing it to be deployed with a nuclear power plant that really drives up system costs, but might actually help give you long-term emission reductions, uh, particularly if you have uh, learning curves associated with that level of deployment. Uh, so we just received a grant from Pervo, or a geothermal developer who are interested in this question as well, because they're interested in, in coupling their energy with DAC. Uh, and then there are some questions around how to optimally design these, these steam flows at the power plant level. So we plan to do some detailed Aspen simulations to look at how you should optimally design these systems and what is the, the, the value or the opportunity cost for every gigajoule of steam heat that you're diverting to DAC versus uh, using it for, for power generation. So I'll stop here and look forward to questions. Do you know how well your carbon capture, um, how compatible it would be with new generation reactors like generation four that they don't even have steam or uh, small modular reactors and so on? I don't. We so we basically did um, all the modeling here based on the pressurized water yeah, reactor. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Or the new AP1000, which is very similar yeah. to the pressurized water reactor. We do want to consider the small modular reactor, but it's just that those are so expensive, we don't even know that they'll be deployed anytime. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, two questions. So, the first one um, is actually about this uh, 2035 scenario that you presented. You talk about the power system. Um, how do you factor in additional electricity consumption from like other sector integration things? Which is also leading to the second question, which is a bit about the lobbying that people talk about a lot because 
DAC also allows you to say, okay, we continue this process as we have done so far, and DAC will save us in the end, or like at some point at least. And um, when it comes to these, um, or this issue, it's, it's actually a big question of um, like, how do, or what do you think of lock-in problems with DAC when you compare it to other measures that might reduce the need for additional renewables, for example, uh, by direct, uh, directly electrifying some of those, like for example, industry applications and so on. Yeah, a great question. Um, so in terms of load on the system, so our scenarios basically account for growth in EV demand. Uh, there is some uh, flexible demand in there, space heating and things like that. So we have projections up until 2035. We don't have uh, increased industrial demand at the moment in the system, so that could have an impact. The total electricity consumption from DAC is actually pretty low. So even in the, the scenario here, where you have 1 million tons of deployment, it's less than 0.5% of the total power load. Um, so I'm not sure how these other demands might impact the system. In terms of the continuing lock-in of fossil fuel plants, absolutely agree. Um, it is a challenge. One could look at it the other way, which is that we need billions of tons of removal and negative emissions to actually get to zero overall in the economy. So deploying back might help lock in and bring the cost down for that, uh, given we need those removals. One thing we do want to do with this analysis is, as I said, we assume this 90% capture rate for CCS. We want to vary that and see what the costs are. Uh, then the questions around methane leakage, so we can look at that as well. Just a lot of cost. Does that answer your question, Ethan? I can just um, just also comment because I'm from Europe and uh, there is some uh, like talks about DAX as well. Uh, by the way, they say like 400 euros or 400 dollars per ton is the cost now, um, kind of. But I I think 800 is more realistic. Yeah. Uh, there is this plant on Iceland built, uh, but that's just a research plant. Uh, but yeah, uh, especially in the North Europe, they they do talk about a lot about direct air capture, but. What do you think, uh, because 2035 is quite low, right? What do you think will be the deployment of, of the technology? Do you uh, believe it will have a significant share really in, in, in these 10 years? Um, you know, how, because it's not just about the electricity or, or heat you have to provide, it's also about the, uh, simply the technology that has to be um, deployed. And also, uh, I mean, it is definitely connected with the storage uh, or, or, or utilization of CO2, which has to be. Yeah. Um, so this is the IEA scenario, uh, net zero scenario, and how they envisage DAC uh, scaling. So right now, you're right, we have about 2,000 tons, which is basically that Iceland plant to produce 4,000 tons of capture per year. Um, so the IEA estimates that we'll need 90 million tons by 2030, which is like insanely you know, <laughs> uh, high compared to today's levels. Uh, and this is scaling to about 1 million tons by 2050. So the order of magnitude that we need to do on DAC is really high, but it, it's the same for every other technology. Like net zero by 2035 or 2050 um, requires scale up of renewables. It, it requires scale up of everything. So I'm not sure DAC is any like anything exceptional in that case. Um, and if the costs fall, as I said, it could help with the other sectors of the economy, offsetting emissions in industry or agriculture. So, and it has limited constraints to scale as opposed to the other CDR methods. So it's got that advantage. In the near term, the, the deployment is really being driven by that corporate procurement. So the Iceland plant is selling credits to Microsoft and, and those kind of JP Morgan. Um, so as long as you have buyers who are willing to pay for those verifiable additional removals uh, for their own purposes, I think that will stimulate quite a bit of deployment. And then, then we have the Inflation Reduction Act credit in the US. So. Thank you, Anya.